Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for taking the time to tune in to our America's In Market webinar. I'm Ashley Ridley from State Promotion, Department for Trade and Investment, and I'm your host this morning. Well, following the success of our first two series of our global In Market webinars, which consisted of 12 webinars and a total viewing audience of over 700 attendees, I'm now pleased to welcome you to series number three. Today, we are joined again by South Australia's in-market expert, Regina Johnson, our Deputy Director for the Americas region based in Houston. So Regina is going to discuss the latest market insights on COVID-19 and then a bit more of a focused presentation on the health and medical sector. So be patient if you're from a different sector, she will touch on some a few items from those areas. but. Today's presentation will be heavily focused in, in the health and medical sector. So before I hand you over to Regina, I'd just like to share a few logistical items. So um, again, apologies if you've heard these previously, I, I tend to, to recap on these. Um, the session is being recorded, will be uploaded to the department's website. At any time during the webinar, you can ask questions through the Q&A section on the right hand side of your screen. Please ensure, however, your question is directed to all panellists rather than specifically to Regina, as this ensures I'm able to see your question and can moderate them um, following Regina's presentation. If we do run out of time, we'll include any unanswered questions and the answers onto our website. And I'll also make a point to follow up with you directly um, and connect you to the most appropriate departmental representative. Happy to help you. Um, and lastly, we'll have a, a 10 second poll pop up at the end of the webinar. Please do take the time to complete this um, to continually improve our communications to you. So my absolute pleasure to introduce Regina Johnson, South Australia's Deputy Director for Americas. Good morning, Regina. Uh, good morning, Ashley. Thank you so much. So hello, everyone. It's good to be back for our third US market overview. So today I will give a COVID-19 update and then I will introduce one of the key sectors that we're focusing on in the US market, the health and medical industry. Within the sector overview, we will look at medtech clusters in the US, key drivers for new technology, opportunities for South Australian companies, the TMC Australia BioBridge Initiative, and things to consider when entering the market. Next slide, please. President Trump's National Social Distancing Guideline expired on 30 of April. The U.S. currently has 1.25 confirmed cases of the coronavirus and a death toll of 73,000 people. Because of these numbers, there are mixed opinions on whether we're opening the country prematurely. However, states have the flexibility on when they can start the three-phase plan to open the country. This is a slide from the last presentation as a refresher on the opening up America again uh, agenda. Social distancing is a key component for each phase. In addition, pres the president has advised that states should wait 14 days of downward trending of confirmed cases before moving to the next phase. Some highlights from each phase. In phase one, this allows restaurants to open at 25% occupancy and elective surgeries can resume. In phase two, this allows for bars to open with social distancing restrictions. Non-essential businesses can continue with allowing staff to return to the office, but in stages. In phase three, unrestricted staffing is permitted in the workplace. Visitation can resume in hospitals and nursing homes with safety precautions in place. As you can see from the map, the majority of the US states are in some form of opening the country mode. The degree to which phase one is implemented varies state by state. Some states have taken a relaxed approach. If they had closed the parks and beaches during the shelter in place, most have relaxed those restrictions. This allows people more freedom to move around while still practicing social distancing protocols. Other states still have shelter in place directives in place, even as they are relaxing restrictions. New York, one of the hardest impacted states, is allowing elective surgeries to resume, but is still enforcing shelter in place directives. They will reevaluate really the status of their situation in mid-May. Tax 
Texas no longer has a shelter in place directed, and the Texas governor, George Abbott, phase one authorization includes the following. Restaurants, retail stores, and movie theaters can reopen if they choose. Occupancy is limited to 25% of their capacity. All museums, libraries may be open at 25% capacity, but if there are any inactive areas where multiple people touch things, those areas must remain closed. Places of worship can open with appropriate social distancing. Outdoor sporting events with less than two, per, I'm sorry, less than four per, uh, participants at any one time are permitted. Barbershops, hair and nail salons and gyms are not open yet in Texas. A further decision on these businesses is pending. A shelter in place means that non-essential businesses or activities are not permitted until the governing authority releases the sector or activity to resume. For example, bars are opening in either the second or third phase, depending on the jurisdiction, and in phase two, restaurants may be allowed to operate at 50% of capacity, up from the current 25% capacity. The U.S. is in a delicate balance of restoring the economy and of trying to protect lives. We will know around mid-May which states will feel ready to implement the next stage. For the next few minutes, we'll take a look at the health and medical industry in the U.S. According to the SelectUSA.gov publication, the U.S. is the largest medical device market in the world at $156 billion, which represents 40% of the global medical device market in 2017. In 2018, Australia exported 893 million pharmaceuticals, I'm sorry, 893 million dollars worth of pharmaceuticals to the U.S. and 725 million dollars in optical and medical instruments. This slide shows several health and medical hubs in the U.S. and I'm using the rankings which were updated in February 2020 by the Medical Design and Sourcing. There are many factors that go into these rankings, the number of industry employees, the number of major device companies headquartered in the state, the amount of VC investment for each state, etc. The hubs are spread out across the U.S. and as we look at the tier one uh, hubs, we can see that they're representative of each region in the U.S. California on the west coast, Minnesota in um, north central U.S. and Massachusetts on the east coast. We won't go through the entire list, but I will highlight a few of, of these uh, hubs for you now, and we'll discuss Texas in a couple of slides. California, which is in the number one rank, according to the IBIS world, California accounts for 25% of the U.S. medical device revenue in 2017. Their medical device venture capital VC investment for 2019 was $1.249 billion. Dollars. California is the home to, of Silicon Valley, a high-tech entrepreneurial hub, and this allows for some interesting collaborations between the medical technology industry and the high-tech industry in the area of digital health. Minnesota, in comparison, spent $80 million in VC funding. Minnesota is the home to the Mayo Clinic, one of the leading healthcare providers in the U.S. Also, 3M, a world-renowned advanced manufacturing and medical device company, is based in Minnesota. Pennsylvania is in the Tier 2 ranking, but they spend quite a bit on VC funding. Johnson & Johnson, which is headquartered in the neighboring uh, state of New Jersey, has its Innovation Business Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Each of the medical device clusters often, uh, offers an ecosystem for the medical field with innovative companies, qualified employees, research and development collaboration, and venture capital funding. By 2023, the U.S. medical device market is projected to grow to $20 billion. U.S. healthcare spend for the past 10 years has run between 17.2 and 18% of the U.S. GDP. Most countries spend around 10% or less of their GDP on healthcare. The U.S. pays nearly twice as much as other countries. Healthcare providers are looking for ways to improve efficiencies 
and consumers are looking for ways to lower health costs. One of the key driving factors for the need uh, for new technology in the U.S. is that we have an aging population. The U.S. Census is projecting that by the year 2030, for the first time, there will be more people over the age of 65 than young people under 18 years old. With an aging population, there are more chronic conditions such as heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. These growing numbers will mean an increase in caseload for healthcare professionals and longer wait times for in-person appointments. One of the trends that we're seeing from the COVID-19 impact is that Americans have become more comfortable and more adaptable to using technology for medical care. Surprisingly, the U.S. government has played a role in this trend. In early March, Medicare, the government issuer for um, inch medical insurance for those over the age of 65, they began to pay doctors for telehealth visits as long as it was done by video conferencing. Doctors and patients have become more comfortable and trusting with alternative means of care. Doctors have been able to use the teleconference to continue the care for not only their mild cases, but also for their chronically ill patients as well. Given these key drivers for technology, what are the opportunities for South Australian companies? The list of, com of opportunities in the U.S play to the strengths of what South Australia has to offer. We have a cluster of medical technology companies that are active in the U.S. market and are looking to expand. We are in the growth stage of the digital health sector with more than 15 companies active in this area. Australia offers a robust regulatory regime to fast-track clinical trials. This makes South Australia an attractive partner for medical research being done in the U.S. In addition, South Australia companies offer innovative ways for applying new technologies across different sectors, such as using artificial intelligence for analysis in medical devices. To support the collaboration of new medical technology and application, the BioBridge Initiative establishes a partnership between the Texas Medical Center, TMC, and Australia's medical technology sector. This initiative aligns with the government's National Innovation and Science Agenda and the Australian Medical Research and Innovation Priorities. As you saw on the previous slide, Texas is one of the U.S. MedTech hubs, with med metal, uh, MedTech uh, innovation hubs in Houston, Austin, and San the San Antonio area. Venture capital spend for the state was $53 million in 2019. TMC is a key component in driving medical research and innovation in Texas and around the world. TMC is the world's largest medical center, featuring 21 hospitals and a multitude of research, academia, and support institutions. This BioBridge initiative is running through their accelerator program, TMCX. Startups participate in a curriculum of workshops and events. The curriculum is an intensive program that covers topics such as clinical trials, FDA regulations, intellectual property, licensing, fundraising, and marketing. The finale of this four-month-long program is the TMC Demo Day, which is an exclusive pitch day to investors, corporations, hospitals, and media. Each cohort is focused on a particular uh, technology. Personified Care, based in Adelaide, provides mobile platforms that allows clinical teams to monitor patient recovery beyond the hospital stay. And Personified Care was part of the TMCX Spring 2017 cohort, which focused on digital health. The next TMCX cohort will focus on companies who are using artificial intelligence in medical devices. There, this is an application process for selecting participating companies. So if you're interested in learning more about these requirements, you can make a note in the comments section in your survey that will come up at the end of this webinar. Next slide, please. If you're looking to export medical devices in the U.S., this slide shows a few things that you should consider. 
This is not a comprehensive list. However, these are things that the Trace Star team can help you sort and direct you to the right resources. The U.S. is a very competitive market. You need to do research to make sure that you are in compliance with safety and industry standards. In addition, you should understand and consider your IP uh, protection in the U.S. The U.S. Food, uh, Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, oversees the sale of medical devices, including diagnostic testing in the U.S. To import a medical device, the importer will file the necessary paperwork. However, you may need to do some pre-filing of information with the FDA and be aware that your manufacturing facility is subject to FDA inspections. Also, if the device emits any radiation, you will need to seek additional authorization from the FDA. Tariffs and duties are assessed by the U.S. International Trade Commission, and they are subject to change at any time, so you should refer to their website for as often as possible for the updated information. Custom brokers are licensed to the U.S. Department of Treasury. The brokers assess tariff clarifications, quota compliance, and any obstacles to entry. To ship your product, you need a custom broker and a freight forwarder. And TradeStar can help you identify these resource, resources and additional resources for determining sea and air uh, transportation costs. As far as a distribution channel, you can distribute directly uh, in the market or through a third party uh, distributor. When you're looking to export any problem, uh, product, um, there is quite a few things to consider. So remember that the DTI provides resources to help you along the way. We're making some progress in the U.S. to get the economy moving in a safe and responsible manner. It's going to take about 10 days or so to determine what the next steps will be for the states. In the meantime, I have talked about some ways that the Trace Star team can uh, help. The U.S. has many med tech hubs, so we and Markin can help by providing market research identifying potential clients in the market, and reaching out on your behalf to those clients. If you need any assistance or you would like to speak to a DTI representative, please make a note in the comment section of your survey. We'll be happy to follow up with you. So Ashley, this concludes my presentation, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Regina. That was fantastic. Um, what a wonderful insight into the health medical se sector, um, really in depth, so thank you. Um, this, this particular industry has been of high interest to our attendees in previous webinars, so um, I'm sure the information and advice will have been well received. So while, we have, <laughs> while we have you with us, Regina, um, I'm going to ask our viewers to ask away any questions you may have. It's certainly a great opportunity while uh, Regina is here online with us. Um, so Regina, one question that has come through is, uh, what are some of the key conferences for medical sector in the US? And do you have an update on whether conferences will be taking place? Well, the, the major conference for uh, this sector is, um, well, it would have been called Bio 2020, uh, but it's been um, re-marketed uh, as Bio Digital uh, 2020 because the conference would normally have been held uh, on site in San Diego uh, in uh, California, which is the number one med tech uh, hub. But however, due to current um, you know, circumstances, the conference has moved to an online uh, platform. Um, so the conference will be held online from the 8th to the 12th of June. That's great. So if people need further information on that, head to the website perhaps, or um, what, what's your they can head to Yeah, definitely head to the website. And then we can also provide a link uh, when we post the comments. Sure. Thank you, Regina. Um, a question's come through from Jason Valentine. Um, Angelix Biolabs works in the US clinical trials space. COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the equity markets. With biotech being a high risk, high return investment, has there been a slowing of investment by VC and PE funds into biotech at this stage? Um. 
That's a that's a good question, and I, I don't have the answer off of the top of my head. Um, definitely, you know, here in um, the U.S., uh, there has been, you know, with the the healthcare industry a high focus on uh, the COVID, you know, nineteen working with um, the patients that have been afflicted by that. But as part of that, there has been a lot of innovation. Uh, that has come about as far as you know the the the, um, the search for you know back vaccines for looking at alternative ways for creating the masks and the uh, the PPEs that are that are needed and so some of this innovation has originated from these small companies that that have done this so as far as you know if they're you know what type of funding they're receiving at this time. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of that, but I can look into that and we can provide the answer uh, when we post the questions. Sure. So perhaps, Jason, if, if that hasn't answered your question fully, um, you can you can help um, clarify any specific points and we can reach out to you. Let us know if you'd like that to occur. Um, we have a, a regular tuner in her. Adriana O'Brien is here with us again. Hi, Adriana. Um, Again, she's mentioned what an awesome presentation, Regina, so thank you. But um, oh, she's, thank you. she's involved in the international education, of course, and she's just wondering if there's any updates on the way schools are operating. Um, well, currently, um, schools are, uh, particularly when we look at the, the high school or even at the college level, most of them will continue finishing their education online. Um, the, for Texas, um, the governor would like to see schools reassemble, but we're getting close to the end of our school term and the teachers and um, students that have adapted to the online learning. So the one good thing about this is that um, maybe you know, they can make some type of arrangements for graduation um, as we're coming out of this. Another thing that they are considering since there's been so much time from being in the physical environment of the school, um, they're looking um, to start school earlier. Uh, for example, um, the Houston Independent uh, School District uh, would normally start towards the end of April and they've already filed some paperwork with the, um, the Texas Education Agency to begin school in early, um, early to mid-August. So school districts are looking to, to go back. Uh, I heard one school district that was thinking about July as far as a return date. Uh, because one of the issues that we're facing with um, going to the online uh, platform and going so quickly is that a lot of there were a segment of students that weren't prepared for it. You know, they didn't have access to a computer, they didn't have uh, the uh, broadband uh, or internet access. So in some school districts, it's up to 25% of students that have not been back in touch since we have gone to this platform. So, you know, there are, you know, cases where this is working well, but, you know, they're, they're trying to make sure that everybody stays engaged. And so they may be looking to bring the students back early. Well, that's good. And I'm sure in, in upcoming updates, you'll be able to share some further insights on that uh, education space. Um, of course, just recapping on something you mentioned earlier, um, Bio 2020, the, the digital version. Um, now, I understand DITI is actually attending um, or participating in Bio 2020. So, um, of course, companies can reach out to Regina or Dirk Bielan, um, who is the director for our health and medical sector, if companies need more information. So, perhaps again, as Regina has mentioned, uh, you can either submit it through the Q&A box or at the end of this session there will be a poll that comes up and you can provide some details and uh, we can have someone connect with you to share some further information about being involved in that Bio 2020 conference. Again, it looks like to be an online digital version. So uh, awesome. sounds like it's actually uh, a very open um, and uh, applicable to any, any companies involved in that space. Um, uh, Darren Mason has submitted a question. Has there been any requests from USA medical pharma companies regarding facilities in SA? Do you think there's an opportunity for a joint venture for local and USA based company? 
I would say yes, uh, that there, you know, it's definitely that opportunity up there. Uh, the, and, and I will just have to say, I have not done the direct research in this area uh, myself, but just getting a sense of, you know, that the opportunities that they're looking at and uh, expanding and doing the research and development, then I'm sure that they would be looking for, you know, partners. So, uh, yeah, if you would put your details in a uh, in the comment section, I would be very happy to follow up with you on that. Yeah, so Darren, um, we, we can get in touch with you and, and look at what your business operations are about okay. and um, perhaps uh, talk about any opportunities as, as specifically for your company. So ha happy to do that, Darren. Um, please keep any questions coming through. Um, we do have another question at the moment, um, otherwise we'll be wrapping up following this question. Um, you mentioned the crossover of artificial intelligence in the medical field. What other cross-sector opportunities do you see? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this is something that I will definitely be looking at over the course of my uh, interaction and gathering, you know, intelligence here in market. But later in the year, I am looking to attend a conference called Pumps and Pipes. Um, and this was a conference that originated between the medical and the oil and gas industry uh, because they were looking at uh, the similar the science behind, you know, pumping blood and pumping uh, oil. So there was some synergy there as far as exchanging ideas. And it has since expanded, uh, expanded to include the space industry and I believe on uh, high tech uh, as well. So this conference is an opportunity to, for people to come together to talk about the challenges that they are looking at, uh, particularly in you know, the medical field and how, you know, the energy or, or aerospace or uh, high tech can be used to address some of those um, issues. And then, of course, we always have the, the, the uh, crossover of, of cyber security into the uh, medical field as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Regina. Um, so I think you've kept that off really well. Um, as everyone can see, we have so much government support here for you. So um, we have people like Regina, our offshore government representatives, um, our locally based staff, our international market teams, sector focused teams, trade start advisors. We're all here to help you. So that comes to the end of this webinar. Thanks, Regina. It's been great to see you again. And to have you yes, this morning. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's always good to see you too, Ashley. Yeah, yeah, always. And um, now please take the time to complete the short poll that's now on screen. Um, this helps us tremendously. Share your feedback. Um, tell us what you want to hear. We, we really do appreciate that. Yes. And lastly, um, Monday afternoon, 11th of May at 2 o'clock, we have the next in-market update um, from our experts from Austrade India to discuss the current impacts on COVID-19 and opportunities in the wine sector in India. So to all the, the wine um, specific companies, um, this should be a really good uh, session for you to listen to. Um, thanks again all for coming um, this morning and uh, Regina, really have a lovely day. Okay, you too now, bye-bye. Bye-bye, see you later.